early 2016, my life was taking a turn in the wrong direction. My hours working maintenance on the pipelines had been cut because my boss and I were having issues. Now those issues directly related to the fact that he was a prick from Atlanta and could not relate to us country boys in Alabama. You know how people are. They can say all kinds of stuff to you. But the minute you defend yourself, they act like children. Things were looking bad until we had this gasoline spill. Department of Transportation got involved, started investigating it. It hits the news. My boss was a frog in a frying pan. And me being one of the best heavy equipment operators she had, he had to call me in. We have a sit down. He says, this spill is all in the news. My boss's bosses are all over their ass, which in turn means my boss is on my ass. And we need to show some major progress. I'm going to need you to work long hours, get retention ponds built. That's our top priority over the next four days. He goes on saying the organization is having all kind of problems with these tree huggers and mother Gaia earth cult people. They're all up our ass. And the shit is rolling downhill. I know you and I have had our differences, but I'm going to need your help. So far, Kevin is the only heavy equipment operator we got out there at the location. And as you know, Kevin can't do anything right. Can I count on you to get this done for me? Understand, this is the same guy who had just recently cut my hours because of something I said. So I wasn't pom-poms in the hand, rah-rah, hoo-rah about helping him out with a damn thing. So my question to him was very, very simple. How many hours am I going to be working? And how much overtime are you going to be paying? And his reply was sweet music to my ears. Work as many hours as you humanly can without violating the OSHA rules and regulations. You understand? As for overtime, because this is a disaster that is affecting the entire nation, you're not getting normal overtime, you're getting time and a half. So I need you to get out there and get this work taken care of. Next thing you know, I'm out in the field with the guys. Now, I'm pretty sure you've had gasoline on your fingers. After you pumped it and you got into the car, you know how strong that smell of gas is? Well, imagine being around millions of gallons of gas. Take that smell that's on your fingertips and multiply it by 100. That's exactly what we were dealing with. And even outdoors, it made you high as a kite. Thank God forbid. Understand, this is dangerous work because God forbid there was any type of spark or anything goes down. We got one hell of a fire on our hand. Now, let me stop right here for a moment and say, I had never heard of these dog man creatures before this. However, since these events, I've learned a hell of a lot more about these creatures and how they use pipelines and right of ways as corridors for their traveling. So let me tell you what happened. Picture this. My job is to dig multiple retention ponds for these millions of gallons of gas to go into. From there, we can treat the gasoline and we can deal with it. It's myself and six other guys. I'm in the digger doing my job, but I notice Kevin walking past the porta potty into the wood line. Stop here again real quick. That same porta potty that he walked past had been mysteriously knocked over a few hours early. We had to go get heavy equipment and lift it back up. So nobody was going to use that porta potty. So I see him headed over into the wood lines to take a leak. Understand, it's dark outside, but we have generators and we have lights. The lights are around the perimeter of the work site, backed up against the edge of the tree line. So when he goes beyond the lights, it's pitch black. Like I said, I noticed him heading that way, but I continue to do my work. A few minutes later, he comes running out of the tree line, stumbling, pants down on his knees. I can't audibly hear what he's saying because I'm locked inside the cab and the engine is running. He runs over to his truck, hops in, cranks it up, and speeds off. Listen to me. Again, I cannot hear what's going on outside, so I'm thinking to myself, okay, he went over to the woods, he had to take a pee, maybe he got to take a shit, so he took off. But that's when I see the look on the other guy's faces. But again, I still can't hear over the sound of the engine and the generator that's going outside. So I turn it off and climb out. That's when you hear this screeching sound coming from the woods. That converts 
into a howl. I mean like this high pitch screech that keeps going and then changes pitch completely and ends in a howl. Not a wolf howl, but like a werewolf howl from a freaking movie. It was crazy. We're all standing there like, what the hell is going on? It happens two more times and then it stops. A few minutes later, we get together, have a tailgate meeting, trying to discuss what the hell happened. Now we're all standing at the tailgate of one truck, cell phone on speaker, calling the guy over and over and over who just left, but it keeps going to his voicemail. Afraid, we all stay together for the next 15 minutes, but nothing else happens, so we go back to work. Listen to me, my hours have been severely cut, so everyone is leaving. It's 5.15 a.m., the next crew comes at 7 a.m., but I need the hour. So I take a break, hop in my truck, and lay the seat back. My plan was to get three hours of sleep and then go back to work. So now I'm there all alone in a truck. It's running. I'm sleeping. Door locked. Listen to me. I wake up at 6.45 a.m. Just scared. I mean, frightened out of my mind. Eyes wide open, looking left and right. I wasn't having any nightmares. I wasn't having any dreams. Now, Listen to me, I'm not even sure why I even woke up this way. I can't even confirm to you that I heard something or I smelled something or something touched my vehicle. But I just remember waking up deathly afraid. Like everything inside my spirit and my soul was afraid. And again, and again, I'm not one of those people who has dreams or nightmares. When I go to sleep, it's just pure darkness and sleep. And you know how it is when you first wake up from your sleep, you open your eyes. Sometimes you got crust in your eyes. But most of the time, your vision is slightly blurred. Well, that didn't happen. I popped straight up, eyes wide open, seeing everything around me. The sun wasn't even all the way up yet, but there was a little bit of light outside. Now, it's important that I phrase this to you correctly because, again, I had just woken up out of my sleep. But like I said, I was completely terrified. I believe I saw... This wolf walking on two legs right next to the porta potty over there by the tree. It walks up to the porta potty, sniffs it, bumps it, stands there for about 30 seconds, then walks into the woods. Now, over the years since this has happened, I've thought about this a thousand times. I can confirm a couple of things. I didn't hear anything. There was no shaking of my truck. I just woke up with my eyes wide open. Can't explain how that happened can't explain why it happened the only thought I have on it at all just maybe just maybe what was going on around me at that moment in time was so terrifying so frightening that my subconscious mind felt something freaky and weird was going on triggered my conscious mind my eyes opened and I saw it that's the only thing I can think of and now I'm pretty sure you're saying to yourself okay dude you guys heard something in the middle of the night you was brave enough to stay out there You went to sleep, and then you had a nightmare. That's all it was to it. It's a nightmare. I tried to tell myself the same thing. But here's what you don't know. While I was sitting there, eyes bucked wide open. I saw this thing, bumped the porta potty, walk into the woods. I cracked the window just to make sure I was awake. The smell of gas hit my nose. I remember the smell of the gas. I wasn't asleep. So now I'm driving. I know what I saw was real, but I didn't want to you know deal with it mentally I didn't want to deal with that kind of shit you can call it fight or flight you can call it whatever you want but I just needed to get away but what I do know is what I saw was taller than the freaking porta potty and I just couldn't mentally deal with that so I decided to go get me something to eat put some food in my stomach that's when my boss calls me asking me where I'm at I tell him I'm getting a bite to eat he tells me he needs me back at the site because the first guy who left last night had an accident truck was run off the road and he hit a tree remember i haven't had any sleep other than the sleep i got in the truck so i tell my boss look i'm gonna get some coffee in me some more food in my system and i'll get back out there now i finish my breakfast head back over there and get to work after about four or five hours pass my eyes are getting heavy and it's at the point where it's dangerous for me to be operating any kind of equipment around any human being because i'm falling asleep so I take a break, head to the truck, try and get some shut-eye. My plan was to sleep until 5 p.m. The night crew came at 6.45 p.m. So let's sleep to 5, 
get up about six the night crew should be there and i'm back to work my plan was to sleep until 5 p.m when the next crew started their shift but nope i oversleep and my co-worker don knocks on my window at 6 45 waking my ass up telling me we need to get to work listen to this he and i are standing there outside of my truck talking when the powder party is knocked over again but looking in that direction there was no one anywhere near it now the porta potty needs to be picked back up we get some equipment lift it up and i'm back to digging the retention pond everything is quiet until 4 a.m when the power goes out all the lights go out and i probably need to be way more specific about what i'm saying the floodlights around the outskirts of our construction site right on the edge of the wood line they go out but the generator which was powering those lights continue to run again let me say this to you and i want you to think about it because i've thought about it over the years again the floodlights all the way around our job site go out simultaneously not one by one but the generator does not stop working then i hear this growl it's louder than a generator outside it's loud enough for me to hear inside the glass cabin of the piece of equipment that I'm working on. Flashlights come on. I turn the lights on in the cab, spinning it in the direction of the guys. That way we can see what's going on. And that's when I see this thing standing right there less than 25 feet away from Don. His back is turned to it. It's on two legs. I estimate 12 to 13 feet tall. I'm 45 to 50 yards away. You can see its eyes orange and yellowish. Now, I know Don didn't see it, but I guess he felt it because he turns around, looks behind him, drops the flashlight, and starts running. Now, let me pause right here in the story and tell you something really important. I can confidently tell you that two people saw this thing, Don and Chisholm, because looking in Chisholm's direction, he is frozen in place with the flashlight pointed to the ground. He stays that way for a solid 10 to 12 seconds and then starts to run. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never in my life seen a man run on his shoulder. But imagine this, he takes off running, trips, he hits the ground, his legs never stop running. So now he's on his side, his shoulder is, his shoulder is digging into the ground, his legs are still moving. I don't even remember this man pushing his hands down to the ground to stand back up, but somehow Chisholm got vertical and took off running. Looking back in the direction of this creature, it is standing there in the light, looking at everybody run. It was like it enjoyed the fear. Now, I wanna be clear with you, from the point in time from which Chisholm clearly performed some kind of miracle and got back vertical, I was looking at this thing and it was standing and staring at them running. Didn't take my eyes off of it. And when I tell you that this creature was fast, this thing was fast. You have to understand, I have the equivalent, you have to understand, I have the equivalent of two headlights on the front of my vehicle. It is casting this wide beam of light going far left and far right. And let me tell you something, this thing turns its shoulder slightly. And then it takes off like the freaking Roadrunner. You know how in the cartoon the Roadrunner would plant its feet, dig in, and then take off? Well, that's what it did. You see it shift this weight, leaning back on these freaky, huge, dog-looking legs. Then it takes a leaping step. Remember, I have that entire area lit up. Lights from left to right. That leaping step darts it from the center of my lights to the edge of where the light shines. And the next motion it made, I didn't see it. It was just gone. I saw it go from the center of the light like it skipped over to the far right, and then I just didn't see it anymore. Understand, every man on this job site saw this. And guess what we did? Every man on this job site left. That was 5.15, 5.20 in the morning, my boss is calling me. One of the guys from the other crew that's supposed to work the daytime gets there and finds that no one's there, the generator's running, the lights are off, my boss is fussing at me, and I'm like, listen, boss, you're going to need to get some security out here because we got a problem. 
he presses me saying, look, what kind of problem you got? What you talking about? And I know it sounds crazy, but I tell him, listen, boss, it's a werewolf. Now, telling him this, I felt absolutely crazy and insane, but the only words to describe what I saw was a freaking werewolf. So I say, boss, we had a werewolf out there. Now, I'm expecting him to be mad, cursing and screaming, you know, get your ass back out there to work, quit fucking playing games. But no, surprised the living hell out of me. He simply says, okay, no problem. He says, okay, no problem. Listen to me. I'm headed that way. But I need you to go back out there and be there with the guy who's currently on the job site. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Those words, a werewolf, rolled through my boss's ears with no problem, just like water rolls off a duck's back. So I turn around. I get back to the site. It's me and the other guy there. An hour later, private security pulls up. We talk about dudes in all black, tag vests, sunshades, and rifles. My boss pulls up, asking me to come over to his truck and explain to him what happened. I go through the entire story. He says, so, you, Don, Chisholm, and the other guys on the site, all of you guys saw this. And I said, yes, sir, we did. He says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the rest of the day off, and I want you to meet me in the office with the rest of the guys in the morning. So 8 a.m. the next morning, we're all in his office, and he says, you cannot talk about this. Not that you're crazy, not that you were hallucinating, not that it wasn't real. His exact words are, you cannot talk about this. When one of the guys inquires about why we can't talk about it, he goes on to explain to us that those creatures have been around since the construction of the pipeline and that our company knows about them. Then he says, I've been in the business for 28 years and I've seen it all. You have to understand, I have been in your position, guys. I'm telling you how this is handled. If you guys get to talking about what you saw, what you physically saw and experienced, then it's going to make it hard for us to get guys to go out there and work. When it's hard for us to get guys to go out there and do work, then the company takes a loss. When the company starts taking a loss, then guess what? You lose your job because they can't afford to have you. The best thing for us to do and the thing we've done in the past is we have a rule. We do not talk about it. Then he opens his drawer and takes out this metal lockbox opens up that metal lockbox and pulls out fifteen thousand dollars cash and starts handing out cash to us like it's freaking christmas his exact words as he handed everybody cash was taking his money means you keep your mouth closed opening your mouth about this again means that i'm gonna have to fire you i want you guys to go back to work there will be security we need to get this job done so we take the money, go back out, finish the job, and he's right, not a peep out of these things. But get this, as a job is coming to a completion, I'm out on site taking a break, my boss is out there, we hop in his truck, we're sitting there talking, and he tells me again, listen man, I was once in the field, I was once in your position, there are things that I've seen and heard out here in these woods that not only gave me nightmares, but gave me waking nightmares. My boss shared those stories with me, and I promise I'm going to share them with you. So back when this happened, I had no clue what this thing was. It was the early 80s, and reruns of In the Heat of the Night were playing constantly on TV. I was 12 years old, and every time that show came on, I knew it was time for me to fall asleep. Day in and day out after school, I would come home, do my homework, eat dinner. My mom would force me to get in the bed. She allowed me to have the TV on, but for the most part, before this show came on, I was either asleep or in the process of falling asleep. Now, in order to understand how this went down, you need to understand how my room was set up. My bed was up against the wall by the door. My TV was on top of this kind of Chester stand that was right next to the window. I didn't like having the curtains open, so typically I would close the curtains at night before I went to bed. This particular night, my mom prepares dinner a little bit later than normal, which in turn leaves me up a little bit later than normal. 
I'm laying in bed and then the heat of the night comes on. It's one of those TV openings that you can never, ever forget. And really for the first time, I make it past the intro song. I'm laying there watching TV and I notice something move outside of my window. Can't fully make it out because the light is off in the room and the TV is bright, but I can definitely see movement by my window. And now in the area I grew up in Mississippi, there was plenty of open land. So it wasn't like I had a neighbor right next door to me that would be peeking through my window. The show was halfway over and it cuts to a commercial and I see the movement again. Now I'm thinking, who the hell is outside my window? So I get up, I walk over to close the curtains. When I get right next to the TV where the light from it is no longer shining in my eyes, now I realize I'm face to face with some type of creature. It looked like a gigantic Doberman pincher. Its nose is pressed up against my window. Its ears are long and they're twitching. And this thing is sniffing. My eyes lock with its eyes and it starts licking the window. Now, at first I just thought someone's Doberman pincher was at my window licking it. And then I realized that our house was up on stilts. We lived in a floodplain. If there was a dog outside my window, its head should not be up that high. But at the same time, this thing didn't seem threatening whatsoever. So I hurry up out of my room, I go find my dad, and I say, hey, dad, we got a big dog outside the window. Literally, the minute my dad walks into my bedroom door, I hear him say, holy shit. He runs to his closet, grabs a shotgun, and goes outside of the house. I hear him shoot two shots, and then he comes running back in and locks the door. I tell him, dad, that was just a dog, a Doberman Pinscher. He looks at me and says, son, I don't know what that was, but that wasn't a dog. And that night, I sleep in the bedroom with him and my mom. The next morning before I go to school, he takes me outside and we walk around the side of the house. And dad points out to me that in order for this thing to have its head in my window, it would have had to be seven or eight feet tall. He looks at me and says, son, have you ever seen a dog seven or eight feet tall when it stands up? And I say, no, sir. He said, that wasn't a Doberman pincher and I want you to keep your curtains closed that night. Now that was the only time I ever saw this creature, but every night, before the sun went down, I made sure I closed my curtain. dogman encounter happened when I was a senior in high school. This was senior skip day and everybody was excited about the bonfire that we were having that night. Imagine the scene, me and my boy Rex spend the whole day trying to bribe his older brother and to going to the liquor store and getting us liquor. After about six hours of talking to his brother and pleading and begging with him, his older brother goes to the store and buys $200 worth of liquor, enough for us to bring to the bonfire and be the center of attention. Now, let me be clear with you. The reason why I needed to be the center of attention is because of Ella. Ella had been my crush all four years that I was in high school. She and I had just started to get close. And this senior bonfire was probably going to be my last opportunity to have sex with her before she went off to college. So now I'm going all in all the chips on the table trying to make this happen and just so you can understand geographically what's going on i was born and raised in chattahoochee florida which is right on the border of florida and georgia and every year the senior class would venture across that border into georgia to a place called river junction right there along the river is where everyone would build these huge bonfires play music get drunk sit in cars have sex smoke weed do drugs you did whatever the hell you wanted to do get this the evening rolls around rex and i head out there with the alcohol people are already starting to arrive some of the other seniors are building the bonfire and as soon as the sun goes down we light the fire music starts playing the parking lot is full of people it's going all the way down and then I'll never forget this. I'm standing there with Ella. We're drinking out of red plastic cups. She's on her third vodka and cranberry juice. I can see that she's starting to get a little tipsy. And we head back to my vehicle, which is parked closer to the river. 15 minutes later, it's getting hot and heavy. The windows are fogging up. It's about to go down. I'm about to get what I want. When Rex knocks on the window to the vehicle, asking for his freaking jacket, ruining the moment. Giving Ella an opportunity to rethink what she was about to do. She puts her shirt back on, exits the vehicle, 
it begins to lean on the hood of the car. So now I have to start the process all the way over. I'm walking around the front side of the car. I grab her by her hand, spin her around, lean my butt up against the front of the car. I'm looking her in her eyes, telling her how much I like her, how beautiful she is, complimenting her chin, her ears, her nose. When Ella's eyes unlock from mine and begin to stare off behind me. The first time she did it, I thought it was weird, but I got her attention back. But over the next two minutes, her eyes keep darting away from me to something behind me. Now remember, we're both partially drunk. I'm a teenager. My hormones are raging. I have one hell of a boner standing there holding her by her waist, pulling her body into me, and she's not paying fucking attention. So I say, Ella, what is wrong? That's when she says, I think I see some dogs over there in the tree line shifting my body and her body to the side turning my head to the left and looking into that tree line i see exactly what she is talking about and that is not a freaking dog i don't know about you but i've never seen a dog the size of a freaking moose this was a black super furry nappy haired dog the size of a moose now I'm standing there thinking to myself, okay, maybe you had too much of this vodka, and she's damn sure had too much of this vodka. So I turned completely around, squaring myself up with it to take a second look. And yes, indeed, it is a big black dog, literally the size of a moose, moving amongst the trees towards the river. Now back then I knew absolutely nothing about dog, man. Only thing I knew was that shit wasn't normal at all. So I grab Ella by the hand and slowly start working my way back over to the bonfire where the rest of the people are. Now when I get back to the bonfire, my friend Rex is drunk off his ass, talking all loud. He comes over, puts his arm around the two of us and says, I'm sorry, I know the two of you were trying to get a good nut in that car and I knocked on the door. I'm sorry, you should go back to the car and finish what you started. Now, she starts to tell Rex about the giant dog over in the woods, and now Rex's drunk ass is headed in that direction. And I'm holding his arm trying to stop him. He says, let me go. Let me go. Don't try and tell me what to do. I ain't no dog that big. Let's go look at the puppy. I want to see the puppy. And I'm saying, Rex, this is not a puppy. Puppies are not as big as mooses. Rex, come your ass back over here by the fire. Let me go. Let me me go rex gets over to my vehicle right by the front bumper next thing you know he turns around hauling ass running in our direction and he ain't drunk no more he's pretty freaking sober at this point in time he says bro 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 we need to go we need to go bro there's a giant fucking wolf over there bro we need to go come on let's go understand this is a huge party music is blasting rex is making a damn fool out of himself because he's so afraid and i think his fear caused ella to start to sober up as well because the next thing you know she's talking about leaving the party too remember my whole objective was to have sex with ella next thing you know the three of us are in her car leaving we have left my car in that spot i'm the least drunk person of us all so now we're trying to travel back across state lines into florida drunk as hell we drop Rex off at home and Ella and I head to Heritage Park which is nowhere near as private as where we were before and make a long story short I didn't get none a couple of weeks after graduation Ella is gone and I literally never see the girl ever again